A while back, we decided to make a real scale mod for Wings of Liberty. Finally, StarCraft could be played as it absolutely was not intended to be, in all of its titanic capital ship glory. The mod was kind of jank. Really fun, but it was our first time making something like this. We had a lot of details to iron out. But with Heart of the Swarm, we got to use everything that we learned from Wings of Liberty, and we ended up with one of my favorite mods ever. This entire video exists to convince you that this mod is freaking awesome and you should play it. And of course, it's free for everybody. If you want to play this mod yourself, you can do so on the Giant Grant Games Custom Campaign Manager, linked in the description below. Now let's take a look about how the swarm is supposed to be. Labrat starts off with the greatest innovation of our time, a skip tutorial button. We blast up a base so quickly that real scale Valerian gets very mad at us. Real scale Zerglings cost two supply, and come in packs of 10. I'm 60 seconds into this campaign and have 90 units, just as it should be with the Zerg. The Zergling wave washes through the first mission without a care in the world, until they reach the Eradicator. One thing I stressed to Orca Warrior as he was working on this mod is that RTS boss fights really kinda suck, so let's try to make some really cool stuff. And boy did he deliver. Even the first mission boss is a monster, killing almost 300 Zerglings before he goes down. The Eradicator's gas attack only has 5 charges, and it never regenerates anymore, so you can't lose on the tutorial, but it does a dang good job of providing some warning for what's to come. Mission number 2 is back in the saddle, being a no-bill- Oh look at the tiny little Kerrigan! <laughs> She's so cute! She's not a 12 foot tall monster anymore, it's adorable! Being a no-build mission, most of Back of the Saddle isn't that interesting. Kerrigan may be tiny, but she's still a monster who's uncontested by small vehicles and infantry. So instead of talking a lot about this mission, let's talk about something even more exciting. The options menu. No, stick with me here, it's actually great. Real scale is supposed to be for fun, so there are a ton of quality of life options to customize your experience here. Autocast workers will just build workers for you until your base is saturated. If capital ships are too large and hard to manage, there's a button to scale them down a bit. You can even start with all the tech unlocked, because why not? And then there's this button, extra units. When you unlock the infestation pit, hive, and spire, you'll add the brood queen, defiler, and scourge from StarCraft 1. Yeah, I'm hitting this button. Back on the other side of things, the mission is going well, until I get to the Archangel. He's just so big. My five Umojin marine buddies are pointless. They get mowed down instantly, and it's amazing. Funnily, the fight is actually easier than normal, because Kerrigan is so small she can avoid the missiles like a champ. It's such a spectacle. We're only two missions in, and I'm in love with this campaign. Rendezvous is the final of the tutorial missions. We get the Queen, which honestly isn't that exciting, but we also get to fight off tanks, goliaths, and infantry. And we get to watch Hellbats kill 40 Zerglings before being taken down, and not caring a single bit, because we are the Swarm. Real Scale's supply has been increased to 250, and we are going to use all of it. Also, fun fact, did you know that you can only fit 500 units in a control group in StarCraft 2? Not something that normally comes up, but we're three missions into this campaign, so it's absolutely a factor already. Once I defended for 15 minutes, Noctul's forces arrive, and we can assault the Terran Fortress. And somehow, on mission three of the campaign, the swarmy feeling has been encapsulated better than any time I have ever played the default campaign. The Zerg campaign is no longer Kerrigan's bizarre adventure, it is the heart of the swarm. Also, I just love the Thor in this mod, look at how big and cool and dead he is. With the tutorial done, I choose to go to Char, mostly because I'm scared of fighting the Protoss. Before we get to attack Warfield, we have to beat up Zagara in the mission that I always forget exists. This means we now have Banelings, and they're pretty decent when everything else is so small. The egg gathering part of the mission isn't that different from normal, but once I catch them all and hatch my Bane army, it is a thing of beauty. At approximately one frame per 150 units, I smash the infinite Baneling line into Zagara's base, and for the first time ever, this line strikes true. Such power! How can you control so many? 
When I was looking for modders to embiggen Heart of the Swarm, there was one mission above all others that I had in my head. One mission that had to encompass the true feeling of scale. I had to find a modder that had the same vision. Welcome to Fire in the Sky. And welcome to The Gorgon. Yeah, I said The Gorgon. Why is that, Zagara? He only needs one. Exactly. Instead of seven Gorgons spawning throughout the mission, the looming death machine slowly drifts across the map with a series of targeting reticles scanning for hostile threats. If you touch one, don't expect a good time for your forces. But it isn't unbeatable. Activating a Scourge Nest blasts the underbelly of the Gorgon, disabling its weapons, who are slowly reactivated over time. Zerg mobility can also help avoid the zones, and if they get too close, burrowing can be a last-ditch attempt at safety. Clearing through the bone trench frantically while the specter of death looms above, sweeping its spotlights around, slowly becoming more and more damaged with each successive Scourge shot is one of the coolest memories of StarCraft that I have. Oracle Warrior absolutely nailed this mission. It is exactly as legendary as it should have been in the base game. This is the strongest weapon that the Terran has to offer, and it feels that way. Fortunately, you never have to fight a Gorgon straight up in Heart of the Swarm, right? After destroying the Behemoth, I get to pick between Zergling upgrades. Both the Raptor and Swarmling Zerglings are quite good here. I offer the Swarmling, who spawns 15 per batch, to synergize with another update. Instead of spawning 10 Zerglings every 30 seconds, Kerrigan's passive Zergling Reconstitution now refunds two minerals each time a Zergling is killed. This works fantastically with my new Swarmlings. To put this to use, I head to Old Soldiers. The sneak attack portion is impressively well balanced in this mod. In the base game, I can reliably get the right outpost down and clear out the majority of the gold minerals as well. In real scale, yup, the exact same progress. I don't know how this was balanced so well, given that every unit is vastly different from normal statistically, but I am impressed. What I'm even more impressed by are Warfield- Yeah, those. Warfield's tactical nukes are real, and the tactic is murder. To combat the Terran threat, we get the Aberration, whose huge towering stature isn't just for effect. We made it so that the Aberration provides 50% damage reduction to units under them, making the Slappy Boys incredible escorts for things like Banelings. Also, Warfield has no chill. This man keeps nuking me, which will not only instantly kill anything it touches, but leaves a cloud of radiation that reduces movement speed. And the cloud lasts a long time. Side note, we talked about this radiation a lot during development and opted for it to not do damage because the corridors on this map are very thin, and it was way too easy for Warfield to continuously just create a permanent force field of death that would make the mission a boring waiting game. Fortunately for you turtle non-enjoyers, my aberrations pack a punch, and once I get a force into Warfield's base, it is a slaughter. This is when I started being really impressed by the towering damage reduction that the aberration brings. It did an incredible job at keeping my smaller, higher damage units alive until they could connect. My forces may still be small, but their synergies are big. Alright, we beat Warfield and only lost a couple hundred zergs to nukes and gorgons. How bad can the Protoss on Kaldir actually be? As I head on over to Harvest of Screams, I grab the Bounty Baneling upgrade, slap down the Ursodon Matriarch, and get a base. It turns out that my Protoss fears were completely unjustified. These guys are pretty chill. The first two bases ask me if I want to come over and watch some Netflix, so I bring some friends over and we have a party. Things are going so well that I decide maybe I can try attacking the final base without the freeze. Turns out, no, I cannot. <laughs> Between the Void Rays and Colossus, I lose a 250 supply army in about 10 seconds. I decide that I might not be cool enough to fit in with the Protoss, so I decide to snipe their final spire and move on. Unfortunately, moving on means going to shoot the Messenger, where the Protoss are bigger, badder, and bolder than before. This mission is actually amazing. The escaping shuttles are titanic, which does make sense considering the next mission is inside of one. Unescorted, they're a simple kill. My new hydralisks tear through unarmored targets. But the escorted waves? Well, the first few are the same story. It turns out that scouts in real scale are still scouts, which means they do exactly nothing and then they explode. 
This mission is the first time I'm making constant use of real scale's crazy zoom distance to get a glimpse of the battlefield. My army is basically ants and the Protoss are huge. The third wave sends a lone Void Ray escort, which is intimidating, but it's not enough on its own to be scary. But do you know what is terrifying? The Tempest. With four waves remaining, the Protoss send in some firepower, and it is big. This monster fires enormous, slow-moving orbs of doom that deal catastrophic damage in a huge area around the target. But the shots can be dodged, either by moving away from the target area or using a really cool mechanic where Zerg can take less damage while they're burrowed. The Tempest starts shelling my spore crawlers, but I can uproot them to dodge the blast entirely while the rest of my forces slowly whittle down the health of the behemoth. After about a minute of fighting, the capital ship falls and its ruined pieces drape the battlefield. It'd be really cool if we found a way to make that deal damage when it fell. It would be really bad for me right now, so I'm glad it doesn't exist, but man, if we could figure that out, it'd be awesome. Despite being amazing, the Tempest Wave isn't my favorite on this mission. The final one is. A swarm of purifier beam crystals spawn, dealing massive damage to all targets underneath them. The Protoss have launched their mothership, and it cannot be stopped. No, seriously, it can't. The beam crystals can be neutralized, but as the mothership itself approaches, laser fire starts raining from the skies. The only option here is to snipe the few remaining shuttles and run. The Golden Armada is too much for the Zerg, and this mission perfectly encapsulates why Kerrigan is so afraid of it. She can't fight straight up when the Protoss gets serious. Another side note, the Void Rays in this mod actually point at their targets as they fire. It's another really neat thing. Not only does it just make sense with the way the Void Ray works, but also helps parsing the battlefield. You can tell which of your units is about to have a very bad day. After fighting the Protoss on the macro side of things, we get to Enemy Within. The mission is basically the same as normal. Except my Hydralisks and Roaches come in pairs, and my Zerglings in sets of 15. This is completely fair and balanced, and there are no Protoss around to dispute this fact. Also, this is Ursadani Vermilion, which started off as an answer when I ran StarCraft Jeopardy and has become one of my favorite memes ever. A devastating loss. This will surely haunt Emperor Valyrian to the end of his reign. With the Protoss and Terran dealt with, it's time to go turn Kerrigan purple. Let's head to Xeris. The first thing to notice about Waking the Ancient is that the Primal Zerg are all pretty close to real scale already. Which, if we were lazy mod makers, would just be the end of things here. But if we can't make things more real scale, we can make them more lore accurate. The Primal Zerg consume essence to rapidly improve themselves and power up, so now they do in game too. Each Primal has an experience bar. As they get kills, they get progressively more powerful. So they start with a random bit of experience, meaning that each Primal is different, and then they can get really strong. And of course, they get a bit bigger when that happens, so the big ones have to be taken seriously. After grabbing all the meat around the map, one Primal shows us that being real scale as a boss is a good job to have. Brack charges in with a massive escort. Luckily enough, this 5,000 HP monster gets a bit lost and separates from the tour group, allowing me to finish him off, but not before he gets a casual 100 kills. This would have been much more difficult if he had stuck with his friends. I also got the corpse of Roach Evolution because it spawns little Roachling dudes, and if I'm gonna swarm, I'm gonna swarm. Next comes the Crucible, a mission that's always famously devastating on any sort of challenge run. This is not a challenge run, though, and instead of pain, we have some fun new toys to work with. The Swarm Host in Heart of the Swarm is really bad. It's clunky and has this root ability that blocks locust pathing, it's expensive, and it dies easily. The real scale of Swarm Host is none of these things. Well, actually, it is really expensive. The real scale of Swarm Host is one of these things. <laughs> It's giant, plops out a bunch of tiny locusts, and the locusts don't get stuck on the host. It does a great job at gumming up attackers and taking them down, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. The swarm host also means that we have the infestation pit, and because I enabled extra units at the beginning of the run, my toys don't end here. First up is the Defiler. I, okay, I was really excited to make Defilers. They're insane. And we will get to them later, but they're actually awful here. The Primal Zerg have so many melee units and all of my stuff is ranged. Dark Swarm buffs melee units and nerfs range, so the math doesn't add up. All I did was waste a bunch of gas and realize I'm an idiot. But it'll be sweet later, I promise. 
The unit that does live up to its expectations is the Brood Queen. These StarCraft 1 flying spellcasters really only have one ability that matters, Spawn Broodling, which translates in English to click attacking Ultralisk and remove the problem. They do very well here. And, uh, Orca forgot to label the bonus objective Tyrannosaur on this mission as immune to Spawn Broodlings, so I kill him in one shot. This interaction really shows the Brood Queen's true colors. The rest of the mission goes pretty smoothly. One thing about real scale is that Kerrigan is far less important to a full Zerg army, meaning that in this mission, not having her isn't as big of a loss. Which honestly is a design that I love. We did this in Nightmare difficulty too. I think that having Kerrigan in the army is fantastic, but having a very strong unit instead of half of your damage from one unit is a lot more reasonable. It means that she's still very important, but she isn't the entire campaign. Supreme is the final primal mission and is mostly the same as normal. Chibi Kerrigan hits hard and the pack leaders are already real scale so nothing has changed there. The main benefit is now it's my turn to use the primal zerg. The gauntlets before each boss, instead of being a time sink, are actually some pretty cool value now. Because my primals level up when they take enemies down, if I can keep them alive and gain experience, they get swole for the pack leader fights and it's hilariously one-sided. At this point in real scale, we've destroyed the Terran, the Protoss, and the Primal Zerg. Now, the only thing left is to destroy your frame rate. Welcome to Infested. The mission design here has always been pretty cool. Infest a series of barracks to get legions of AI-controlled Infested Terran to swarm the enemy fortress. But Infested Terran suck, so we need a lot of them. And that turns my PC into a choppy mess. But it's worth it, because this slideshow is a ton of fun. The Terran Fortress is absolutely insane defensively, with tons of tanks in great defensive positions. Thors to smash flyers, science vessels to repair everything, and even battle cruisers. But the Infestor's Neuroparasite really evens the odds. You can't mind control capital ships in real scale, but the Thor is fair game. Its long-range siege guns are fantastic for whittling down those big flyers. In addition to the Infestor, I have another tool from a while back, the Defiler. The Defiler's Dark Swarm ability makes all ranged units deal zero damage to targets underneath the cloud. Using just a few Defilers, I can create a highway straight up the ramp into the Terran base for my infested friends. This mission is, it's just a fantastic treat. The base being so tough, but the tools to break it being so powerful means there's a lot of interesting ways to play the mission. I really did enjoy dismantling the Terran defenses slowly and methodically. This is the best PowerPoint presentation I've ever played. Before we continue any further, I need to talk about my single favorite thing in this mod, the capital ships. In real scale Wings of Liberty, capital ships were just really big units, and that was fine, but Orca Warrior and I had bigger ambitions. We are both huge fans of the game Star Wars Empire at War, and decided to port the hardpoint system from that game into real scale. If you take a look at a capital ship, it has a series of green icons on it. Each of these is a weapon system. For example, this battlecruiser has air-to-surface lasers, air-to-air -air lasers, and a Yamato gun. Each of these is incredibly powerful and fires independently at targets in range. Instead of attacking the battlecruiser itself, you instead attack the hard points, eventually destroying the weapon system. Once enough systems are damaged, the capital ship will fall. This system is awesome because it makes capital ship fights less all or nothing. Bruising a ship now means its hard points are offline. If you need to retreat, it'll be easier to approach in the future. It also means that weapons like the Yamato Cannon are much stronger, firing routinely instead of once every five minutes or so. Real scale capital ships are cinematic boss fights instead of generic units. This system worked out far better than I ever could have imagined. As we move inside the lab, we get our first glimpse at the teeny tiny hybrid. There are eight of these little guys in this lab that need to be destroyed, and as the first one goes down, it showcases a problem with real scale. The hybrids just are not capital ships, they're little guys. So I build up a bit of an army, take a new base, and move on to the- oh. Oh no. The hybrid might be tiny, but they're little balls of psionic destruction, each with unique powers. The first two are pretty easy, the third is scary, and then the fourth does this. Yeah. 
if I want to fight these, I need the big guns. Fortunately, this mission has some of the biggest guns, in the form of two Brutalisks that can be rescued. The Brutalisk eclipses the hybrid, honestly making it kind of hard to tell what's happening in the fights, but each hybrid is really unique. The variety of psionic powers unleashed here does a fantastic job of showing off why the hybrid are so scary in the lore. The hybrid are second only to capital ships in power level despite being fairly close to people sized, and that is a horrifying concept. Thank goodness for these Brutalisks. Phantoms of the Void heralds the transition into the late game of Heart of the Swarm, and that means it's my turn to have the overpowered stuff. Ultralisks are exactly what Ultralisks should be. They're titanic, cleaving bulwarks, they walk like colossus where smaller units can move under them, they protect, they attack, and they eat hybrid as a snack. Unfortunately, Maz Ultralisk is not enough on its own to claim the temples. As you can see on the minimap, there are a bunch of Protoss capital ships that need to be dealt with. To combat them, I use another of the good old Brood War units, the Devourer. When you pick to either get the Broodlord or the Viper, you now also get access to either the Corruptor or the Devourer. I've opted for the Viper for reasons that I'll show later, and I also get this highly armored anti-capital ship Jumbo Shrimp. With the Ultralisks and Devourers, I charge right into an enemy base instead of towards the temples. Because when I got the Infester, there was another mechanic that I didn't talk about. Of course, the Infester can use Neural Parasite to claim non-capital ship units. But in real scale, they can also infest structures. So I clear out this Protoss camp and then take the Nexus for my own. And after gathering 10,000 minerals and 10,000 gas, I start my mothership. After a long wait, the beast spawns, eclipsing the entire map, and I cannot see anything at all. And then it dies. <laughs> uh, maybe spawning a map-sized unit into a wall of void rays was not the best idea. It does seem like the mothership did quite a bit of damage to the enemy before it was taken down, though. A couple void rays come in, but they get prawned by my devourers, and I'm able to finish off the mission with minimal resistance. But I am going to have to take note. If I want to summon a city-sized weapon onto the battlefield, I have to be a little bit more careful about anti-air defenses next time. With Sky Gear done, there are only a couple missions left before we invade Core Hall, and do you remember the part in Empire Strikes Back where Vader is chasing the Millennium Falcon through an asteroid field? With his ship so large that they can't nimbly move through it? With friends like these gives me the Hyperion, which is a monster ship with up to 36 fighters and 29,000 HP, but the lack of maneuverability as I fight Mira's Marauders through the tight corridors of the asteroid field really helped me understand why Vader was so annoyed. Conviction, on the other hand, is pretty much the same as normal, as most no-build missions are, but it does raise a few logistical questions, such as how the heck did they manage to fit these Thors in here? A prison ship is packing enough firepower to take down a battlecruiser, but somehow isn't positioning that to fight the Leviathan outside. How weird. The Thors do make great friends, though, thanks to my Infestor's Neural Parasite. When the prison guards are real scale, it honestly feels kind of bad at how much of a mismatch the fight is. The Swarm has finally arrived at Core Hall. We have every available tool, and so does Mengsk. Planetfall is first, and honestly, it's pretty easy. Mengsk still thinks that infantry is viable, so it just serves as fodder for my corpse or roaches. The Drop Pods ultimate is better than ever because the Primals level up as they get kills, and I even infested a Starport to make some Vikings for anti-air. Defending the bio launchers and clearing the map is simple, until I hit these two battle cruisers casually holding the north side. My Vikings melt, and I realize I'm gonna need to use the final piece of Brood War tech to take them down. Scourge may be good at exactly one thing, but that one thing is killing capital ships and they're the best in their field. As long as I can distract the other anti-air, there's nothing a battlecruiser can do about a swarm of Scourge. We're at the point where busting an individual base can kill off 150 supply of Zerg forces, but the swarm is so resilient that it just doesn't matter. Another fully maxed out army has popped up before the first one is fully off the field. But that's not to say that a little bit more durability wouldn't be welcome. While the Noxious evolution for Ultralisks is buffed and honestly pretty decent, I am firmly on Team Tarosk, and picking them as my Ultralisk evolution was a no-brainer. A big boy that respawns when killed is exactly what we need to break Core Hall's final defenses. Plus the purple skin just looks way better, like isn't it cool? It's just so spiky and doomy. Death from above is next, and this mission is really not much to talk about when there isn't some crazy challenge going for it. 
Mini Dahaka can easily bust the generators, and his tongue is very long, so he can grab siege tanks without any problems. One thing that can be a bit annoying here is the Psy Disruption Field. When it's up, it deals massive damage to Zerg in the radius, and if an attack sets up ranged units in the field, I don't want to charge into it to fight them. But real scale always has me covered. I just infest this planetary fortress and then grab some vipers and use abduct to yoink it over to my choke point. Because as far as we're concerned, if you can pull a Thor, you should be able to pull a building. So boom, free defense. Once the generators are down, the Terran falls easily to the power of Tarosks and Devourers. As I get to the final defensive line, I realize there are two battlecruisers I have to take out and don't really feel like building Scourge again, so I decide to train about 250 Banelings and bounce them onto the Psy Destroyer. Because why deal with problems when you can avoid them? We've made it to the end of Mengsk's defenses. It's time for the Reckoning. And what are those spotlights coming from the sky? The mission starts off awesome. Three hatcheries, two mineral lines, full technology, and a bunch of workers already unlocked. The swarm starts off ready for battle, and there is no time wasted building up. Which is exactly what's needed, because Mengsk instantly gets aggressive. But we aren't alone. We have our boyfriend Jim to help out. Jim, uh, buddy, you can't park there. You're not gonna fit. In normal Heart of the Swarm, Jim lands the Hyperion and builds a base to help out. But that's dumb? So in real scale, Jim builds a command center like a normal person and gives us the Hyperion Battlecruiser. Which is not only a battlecruiser, but it can also drop mercenary reinforcements. The Dominion's forces at the beginning are scary, but not out of the ordinary. Entrenched defenses have to be cleared out and their bases taken as our own. Eventually, the Sky Fury and Alpha Squadron battlecruisers are sent to Jim, but they're not too bad to deal with. The assault wave after that, though, is the Odin. This is where things get tricky. For fun, on my second channel, Giant Grand Games Archives, I tried playing this campaign Zergwings only. Here's the Odin's kill count. Remember, the Odin was designed to be the ultimate weapon to defeat the Zerg threat once and for all. Yeah, um, Kerrigan has a new ultimate weapon as well. You might remember it from the final mission of Wings of Liberty. She now has implosion, and while it doesn't work on capital ships, the Odin is not a ship. Final weapon indeed, Odin. With that threat taken care of, the rest of the mission is a breeze. I send my swarm to- Oh yeah, okay, Orca decided that the Odin might not be a good final boss fight and instead read up about Minsk's flagship, the White Star, and decided it would be loads of fun to kill my army with it, and he was very successful. With a casual 45,000 HP, the White Star Battlecruiser is one of the strongest units in the game. Rest in peace, maxed out Ultralisk army, I will miss you. But for times like these, I always keep about 250 Scourge in my back pocket, just in case. They do their job great, and now I just have to clean up the map and finish this campaign off. But before we can knock on the palace doors, some of you may have been thinking, this is real scale Zerg, but where's the real scale Leviathan? And this is where I have to be a bit real about game design, engine limitations, and our previous testing of the unit. The Leviathan's design is stupid. It's just too damn big. A real-scale Leviathan is bigger than the largest possible map in StarCraft, and it isn't even close. Motherships are pint size in comparison, which brought about a problem in testing. No matter where you summon a Leviathan, it instantly draws the wrath of every anti-air platform on the map, and that means it either gets vaporized on the spot or is made so durable it can basically solo every mission. And either way, you couldn't tell what was happening because the screen would be stuck inside of his body. Orca tried lifting him into the skies, but for technical reasons, if anything is higher than it currently is, the game just breaks. So the Leviathan had to be redesigned to try to fit some of the flavor, but actually be playable. So when it's summoned, you target a massive area, and for one minute, the off-map Leviathan will tank all of the damage of the anti-air in that zone and spam drop pods and drop blobs of bioplasmid on the enemies. After a minute is over, he goes and takes a nap. The Leviathan ability is by far and away the strongest in any StarCraft campaign. It tries its best to maintain the spirit of what a Leviathan would be, while dealing with an engine that is just not built for it. My use of the ability did a great job at clearing out the defenses in Stukov's way, and my ally joins the fray. As all three of my Zerg allies are freed, they, along with Jim and Kerrigan, besiege the final Terran base. We destroy Mengsk's production and start working on the palace gates and learn that lore accurate means that Mengsk has a history of nuking his own planet to defeat invaders. It feels like every run I do on this channel ends up with an even more competent Mengsk. 
At this point, he's by far and away the most resilient commander in the history of RTS, and honestly, he deserves it. After his final wave of defenders are quashed, the palace gates fall, the campaign ends, and so does my experience with one of the greatest mods I have ever had the pleasure to play. Thank you for watching. If you want to play real scale Heart of the Swarm, I have left a link to the Giant Grant Games Mod Manager Discord in the description, along with a link to my streamed playthrough of this mod with Zerglings only. I hope that you enjoyed this experience and that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Peace!